cool. So Ronan Kelly is up next. Uh, he's from RACE, R-A-C-E. Cool, and we're going to talk a little bit now about um, game engineering and robotics. So a uh, big round of applause for Ronan, please. So, hello. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming and to the Congress for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, so, yeah, let's get to it. I'm going to talk today about VR for robotics in challenging environments. Uh, and the first half of the time, I'm going to actually explain what on earth I mean by that. Um, and then the second half, I'm going to talk about how I see VR affecting not just robotics, uh, but the sort of engineering field as a whole. Uh, so first, just a bit about me. I'm Ronan. I uh, am a software slash VR developer at RACE, which is part of the UK Atomic Energy Authority. So firstly, challenging environments. Uh, so to us, a challenging environment is anywhere it's hazardous to put a human to carry out some sort of task like uh, inspecting some equipment um, or maintaining some machine. Uh, so that could be in space, that could be uh, deep sea, or that could be nuclear. And as you may have guessed, our background is in the nuclear sector. So we at RACE are responsible for maintaining JET, the Joint European Taurus which is the largest nuclear fusion experiment in the world. Uh, and it sits just in a field outside Oxfordshire. Uh, and as you can see, it's very complicated. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, it's about three or four meters uh, high. So you could walk around inside there. Uh, but you definitely wouldn't want to, especially not when it was on, uh, because we uh, inject gas in and heat it to temperatures hotter than the sun. Um, and that causes the process we call nuclear fusion, which we hope will one day be a future uh, energy source. Um, and even when uh, it's, the, it's not currently active, uh, the machine itself does get radioactive. Uh, so we can't send humans in to fix the bits that get damaged or calibrate the instruments, which is why we have a robot we call Mascot to do that for us. Uh, so Mascot has two uh, robotic arms, uh, and these are controlled uh, from a central control room and we have over 35,000 hours of experience operating Mascot. Um, and to do that, we've actually been pioneering the use of VR for over two decades now, uh, from the very sort of uh, early primitive things in the 90s uh, to some quite advanced systems now. So just to give you a sort of idea of what I'm talking about, here's a sh nice shot of the control room. Uh, so you can see uh, the operators there, and I'll show you a little video in a second. But essentially, when we talk about virtual reality, we're not just talking about headsets and controllers, though that might be part of it. That's just an interface to it. Uh, by virtual reality, we, we're really talking about maintaining this sort of digital twin uh, of the real world. So that means we have a model uh, of, for example, Jet, and we input the uh, positions of where the robot is, and we update that in real time uh, from the control system and then we uh, can help the operators uh, operate things like mascot uh, and let them move the camera around and do lots of useful things by giving them a nice 3D visualization on the screen. Uh, so here's a little clip I stole from a promotional video. So that's the outside of Jet. This is the inside of Jet. And this will loop around. I know it's very fast, but you briefly saw a man there. who has got two uh, big arms. Uh, so these are called the master manipulators, and then the two arms on the mascot are called the slave manipulators, and they correspond one-to-one. -one. Uh, and he gets full haptic feedback, so if he picks up a tile as he, as he is there or screws in a bolt, he can feel exactly what he's doing. He gets weight. Uh, he gets full feedback. Uh, and here is a slightly better shot of uh, what the virtual reality system looks like. Uh, so the key thing is, is this is actually uh, representative of where everything is uh, inside the vessel. Uh, during uh, maintenance period. So I should say beyond Jet, uh, we're also working on other projects, including ITER and DEMO, which are the sort of next uh, step from Jet. Uh, so Jet, as I said, is currently the biggest nuclear fusion experiment in the world. Uh, and you can see it there at the bottom. Uh, and there's a standard European human next to it. Uh, and then the next level uh, is ITER, which is currently being built in the south of France, uh, which is going to be even bigger twice as big in every dimension. Um, and then beyond that, DEMO, which is the demonstration commercial power plant uh, for fusion energy. Um, and that's currently uh, not expected to actually be built till the 2040s. But we're already doing design work on how you would actually maintain a facility that big. Um, and VR is a very big part of that. 
uh, and we're also working on other scientific projects such as the European Spallation Source, which is a, a big uh, international collaboration uh, on building a neutron source, which is a big physics experiment essentially, and that's a little shot of what the virtual reality system might look like for that. So that's sort of our background and the work that we have done in the past in virtual reality, but it's obvious that in the last couple of years things have changed. So I said we've been using for VR, VR for over 20 years, and that has uh, tended to be these uh, quite expensive industrial applications, uh, very bespoke. Uh, but with the last two years, the hardware has got a lot more generic, got more commercial. Uh, so even though sort of commercial uh, VR did briefly die in the 90s, uh, industrial VR carried on, but it was horrendously expensive. Uh, but now we've got all these uh, excellent headsets, which are much better than the uh, industrial ones evermore and much, much cheaper. And I think one thing that people don't talk about enough, uh, along with the headsets, is how much better game engines have got. Um, so when I talked about that virtual reality system that we use for Jet, everything you would want to build something like that, the networking, the fancy graphics, um, being able to integrate it uh, with all your code that you might have for your control systems, that's all there uh, in game engines, and they give you all that for free, and they're very low cost to develop with because of that. Uh, so just as a little proof of concept, uh, here's something we put together uh, for a demo of our control system that we're also developing, uh, which allows operators in a, in a control room to uh, control devices. Uh, so for example, here we have an industrial KUKA robot down in our work hall, and you can see uh, the man with the uh, haptic device controller. Uh, so just a little demo, putting a wheel on a little robot that then drives off. Um, and we have a drone flying around as well, and the idea is that this is all controlled by one con uh, control system that gives uh, the operators in the control room, control room uh, generic interfaces uh, to operate everything. Um, and part of that, we, we made this little VR mock-up uh, in the Unreal Engine. But I should say, we probably could have done that with any uh, other game engine. And then also, controllers are the other big thing. So I mentioned uh, that mascot, which we use for Jet, is controlled by these master-slave manipulators, which is this very uh, old technology that's been around actually since 1958. Um, it's still actually really good for what we use it for, which is giving this really low latency, uh, really sensitive haptic feedback. But it's fair to say that the technology has got a bit better since then. So there are some opportunities uh, for, for researching uh, other options. So for example, there's these more generic controllers, which uh, rather than just being able to hook up to one specific piece of equipment, you can use it to control multiple different pieces of equipment that might not actually correspond exactly to the form factor of it, uh, but thanks to the wonder of software, you get a nice abstraction and you can plug and play, essentially. And even with uh, commercial sort of uh, touch controllers like the Rift controllers or the Vive controllers, you are already starting to see the start of uh, haptic feedback coming in. I'm sure that's only going to get better because that's really important for any uh, remote operations of robots, or what we call teleoperation. So again, just as a little proof of concept of that, here's something we had an apprentice uh, put together. We got a really good apprentice scheme, uh, and we had an uh, apprentice student working on making what we are not allowed to call the power glove for commercial reasons, uh, but it is essentially a haptic glove, and I know other people have done things like this, but. What we're more interested in is not necessarily the glove itself, but what it allows you to do when it comes to controlling robots. Uh, so we, here we see uh, the apprentice uh, moving a gripper around, which could be the gripper on the end of a robot, um, and, it's, and it's actually really natural to do that. So whereas the uh, sort of systems that we use on Jet uh, take hundreds of hours to master something like this, once you're plugged in, you can, after a couple of minutes, you get a feel for it, and it's actually really intuitive. So this is something we're, we're still uh, working on and we're hoping to actually link up to a real robot, uh, which will be really cool. So that's some of the initial uh, things that we've got exciting about, but beyond that, we think there's lots of opportunities uh, for VR, uh, not just in robotics, but in the sort of big engineering projects that we work on. Uh, so if I say that robotic teleoperation is just one part of this wider uh, virtual engineering sort of umbrella term, then I think there's a, other, another two sort of key areas where VR uh, could have a really big impact. So the first of that is the design review, which is kind of the oldest process in engineering, which is that you design some component and then you get a bunch of engineers around a table uh, and you all agree on whether it looks like it's fit for purpose. 
But the sort of projects that we work on, such as uh, ITER, which is the big fusion reactor they're building in France, are very complex, and they have people from many different com com countries uh, collaborating. Um, so it would be really useful if you could actually review those components you've designed in situ, where they will actually be in the final machine in a virtual representation, and be able to walk around, get an intuitive scale of where things are, see how it all fits together. Um, and then also do fancy things like simulating the installation. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for things like this. And this is stuff we could be doing now. So here's my little uh, proof of concept of that. Um, and this is a fly-through of jet I made in Unreal. Um, and again, this was just a, well, a day or two's work, really, because we already had all the uh, CAD models. We just had to convert it into a nice format and put it in, make it nice and shiny, uh, because that looks better. And then uh, fly a little camera through it. So the point here is that we can actually get really complex models uh, into these simulations in real time now, uh, which we couldn't really do before. And not only is it really great for PR, PR purposes, so if you put a headset on some school kids and get them walking around the inside of Jet, that would be amazing. Um, but also, we think it would be really useful for actually having these virtual design reviews. I should say the real life uh, jet vessel is even shinier than this, if you can believe it. And so once you've got that, the sort of natural extension uh, is to have multiple users walking around in this virtual space. And of course, thanks to the wonders of the internet, they don't even need to be in the same room in real life. And again, modern game engines just give you this for free, right? That's just multiplayer. And then you add voice communications and gestures, and you basically have everything you could ever want uh, for collaborating on these big international projects when people are making essentially uh, small pieces of a very large jigsaw and want to see how it all fits together. Uh, so here is a, another quick prototype we put together. Um, so this is to show basically how we envisage this sort of thing could work. This is just showing some boring menus, but in a second, we will drag in some interesting models. So we have this sort of library uh, of models that come from some CAD data originally. Um, and then you can let users think, do things like pick them up and uh, walk around them and lots of exciting things like that. And then, like I said, you, uh, you put other people in and uh, you have people cooperating in this virtual space. And of course, not everybody can be expected to wear a headset for these things, so you could just have a couple of people walking around pointing at things and other people on a desktop watching. Uh, there's a lot you could do with this sort of thing. And so finally, the other area I want to talk about is uh, operations management. So when we uh, work on uh, things like JET, uh, the operators have to carry out these really quite complex tasks so to help them out, we uh, already have software which helps them uh, manage exactly what they're doing. So it gives them nice flow charts, and it gives them lists of do this, move here, and they can check things off. And you've also then got a log of everything you've done, which is really important. Um, so that with things like the HoloLens, I think the sort of obvious next step is to start integrating that uh, into displays that quite naturally display things in the world for operators out in the field. So maybe not necessarily for things like JET, where you've got a robot in there, uh, but for things like maintaining uh, a big industrial plant or some sort of facility. Um, if you're trying to send an operator to replace this part, it would be great if they could get some sort of 3D model saying, here's what you're looking for, walk down here, um, and be communicating with a supervisor maybe at the same time. So here's a little concept video we made just uh, walking around uh, the outside of uh, JET. And this is basically not far from what you could do already with a HoloLens. This isn't particularly high concept stuff, but that's the point. This is the really low hanging fruit of what we could already be doing, really. Um, we've already got a lot of this information uh, in databases. We know what's been tested. Uh, we know where people are allowed to go, things like clearances, uh, maybe in uh, areas where you have uh, radioactive environments, uh, things like that. It could be really useful. Uh, so yeah, that, that was kind of an explosion of ideas, um, but I hope some of that was interesting. Um, and I should say we're very open to collaborating on things like this, uh, so please do let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Hey, Ronan, Ronan. Are we, are we okay on time? Yeah? That was amazing. That was fantastic. It's such, such nice work to kind of like see these developments take place and stuff. And I know we've got some questions because I had some eyeballs looking at me to questions. Kabita, don't be shy now. So we'd have a, but wait before you talk. We do need a microphone for the questions and another one got you next. Cool. Are we okay on time? For, yeah? Cool. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take you first. Sorry, you, you got the mic first. Go for it. Um, so have you looked into, so you talked about collaboration, but have you talked about any ways of getting it back into sort of a CAD file? So you go into these meetings, items change and stuff like that, but have you got any way of changing it in the meeting and then immediately going back into the CAD file? That's an excellent, qu excellent question. So something we've been looking at uh, is uh, in the other, other direction, how we can best uh, automate that sort of pipeline of easily getting CAD data uh, that's updated when it changes uh, into VR. But you're absolutely right. Um, and this is something we have been thinking about, yeah. Um, it's very difficult because as anyone who's tried to do these sort of translations between these formats knows, uh, it's really tricky. But yeah. Cheers, thank you. Cool. So Gabita's next, please, Mike. That is my first question as well. <laughs> the second one is, uh, have you played with like combining basically um, like um, augmented reality plus virtual reality? Like, you know, that you, see, you can see multi-user, multi-reality? Yeah, so we, uh, we got our HoloLens just a couple of months ago and we've been playing around with it a lot. Um, so doing things like, we're currently designing uh, a couple of robots, so being able to visualize them in a room and walk around them, that sort of stuff's really useful. Plus um, adding somebody, like, from whatever and in then, the world. Yeah, so you're talking about essentially streaming point. someone else from a virtual yeah. environment. Yeah, no, that's like not that. something, but that's very But you can also yeah. add like different scales, you know, because you can engineer one part from the VR and sure. others where can observe whatever, so how's the process changing. Is this okay. something that could be, you know, interesting that you're into? Yes, absolutely, yeah. We've looked <laughs> at doing things like having a dollhouse representation of a facility and being able to walk around it with, say, a hollow lens or something like that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. You weren't going to say no to that, were you? That's a good, very good question. It's cool. And I think we've got time for like one or two more. Uh, so it's very exciting, the commercial developments in game engines and headsets. And, uh, but what I suppose what the question that raises for me is what the implications are when looking at robotics in uh, safety critical environments and how you deal with things that don't have safety integrity levels, components that have safety integrity, what that means for the development using those platforms? Sure. Um, so for us, whenever, because we do uh, use VR in essentially safety critical uh, situations, uh, but we only ever use it as a support tool at the moment for operators. So there's always uh, a hardwired camera system, but it's not always particularly useful. But the idea is that even if the VR completely fails, they can fall back on that. Um, maybe we will get to a stage where the VR becomes robust enough, but I think that opens up a whole kind of worms on how you certify how, how it's safe. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting problem, yeah. And I know you've got your hand up, sir, but we have to wrap up really quickly, and we're going to have to take the question outside, unless you have, like, the speediest question, the speediest answer. Okay, you've got 10 seconds cell, buddy. <laughs> your haptic glove, how much yep. sensation is there in the VR world when you're using your haptic glove? Uh, yeah, so there's small uh, vibrating motors in each fingertip and inside then the inside the glove, yeah. Um, That's 10 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Love your work. Love your work. Thank you so much, Ronan. Big round of applause for that. It was fascinating. Thank you so much.